you so much, Dr. Lanza, for joining us for this interview today. Uh, let's start off with the first question then. Uh, how do you interpret the dynamic between a language and the cultural identity associated with that language? Okay, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to this interview. And I really enjoy being at Stony Brook University. Okay, uh, how do I interpret the dynamic between a language and the cultural identity associated with that language? Well, actually, many people would probably react immediately and they'd say that, yes, language and cultural identity go hand in hand. And they would say that you can't be seen as a member of a particular culture unless you speak that language. And many studies have shown that on a collective level, language is found to be more of what we can call a crucial core value to some cultural ethnic groups than to others. And in Norway, for example, there have been studies that show that people think it is very important to be able to speak Norwegian in order to be a proper Norwegian. Okay? However, we also have uh, many examples of cultures that have survived without the preservation of the language. Uh, earlier research on minority situations in Australia, for example, showed that uh, Greeks and Chinese had language as a cultural core value, and so they maintained the language, while the Dutch rapidly lost their language because they didn't really perceive it as being uh, so important for uh, maintaining ethnic identity, or rather cultural identity. Um, so language might be important for identity when a group feels it's losing its identity due to public, uh, or rather I should say political or social relations. So the answer to the question, to the relation between language and cultural identity is not clear cut and it depends on the culture's core values and the political and social uh, situation. But in any case, it's really important to emphasize that there's no inherent relationship between language and culture, that that is socially, culturally, and politically constructed. And also, in general, we should say that culture is not static, that we negotiate culture and cultural identity. Thank you. Um, what is the significance of studying transnationalism, specifically in the context of a family, compared to studying transnationalism on a larger and social scale? Mm, that's a really good question. It's something that I'm really interested in. First, I'd like to stress the importance of studying transnationalism generally. Transnationalism is so pervasive today as people are crossing all kinds of borders, cultural, linguistic, ideological, and especially physical borders across nation states. So it's very important to study transnationalism as a social phenomenon. And this we can do, for example, through larger macro studies of population flows across borders and how diaspora function in various geographical areas. For many years, when we think about how we have studied immigrant groups, um, so for many years, uh, immigrants or immigration studies focused on how migrants adjusted to and integrate into their new home. However, today there's so much mobility, as we talked about yesterday, both physical and virtual through digital technology, that we need to understand the whole trajectory of an individual's social life and not just the life in the new country. Um, and we can ask, for example, how does the individual interact with those near and far since they are transnational? And my particular interest in language, uh, are in language rather, and the social cultural embedding of language acquisition and language use. The family is an important social institution, and as I've stressed before, it's, we can call it a community of practice. It's a social unit that has its norms for speaking, acting, and believing, and so it provides a focus on practice, linguistic practices, which is the cornerstone for language socialization. Studying families with a transnational lens, we can reveal how mobility and migration uh, affect language acquisition and language use. We can ask questions like, do language socialization patterns change? How is literacy affected? Are there identity issues related to language use? Are languages lost in translation? And there are many more questions we can ask. So the family provides an excellent point of departure for investigating transnationalism on a smaller social scale. Thank you. Um, in your view, will advancement in digital technology determine the kinds of questions we ask in research on transnational families? Mm. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I would say right away. We've witnessed how the advent of communication technology has provided new affordances for transnational families. It helps them keep in contact with family uh, that's dispersed across the globe. 
and this has contributed to enhancing uh, language and cultural maintenance, for example. Uh, the digital turn has also given a focus in linguistic research to written communication or written language. And traditionally, we know that linguistics has focused on the spoken word. But literacy is in focus now with the myriad of applications for communicating with social media. There are an increasing uh, number of apps available, as I'm sure you know. And all of these will provide us with new questions to ask in research on transnational families. Also, many societies are increasingly resorting to digital solutions for basic household and societal activities. I know this is very much the case in, um, in Norway, so we always say there's an app for this, there's an app for that, right? And this presupposes digital literacy. So we can ask how do transnational families resolve these challenges? However, spoken interaction or linguistic practices in the home will still be very important to investigate. So we have new questions, but still it's, it's important to look at spoken interaction. New questions may address how spoken interactions are the same, or are they different? Or how are they different compared to interactions through social media? Also, one thing that's really important when we talk about the digital um, age and, and digital affordances, that there still is a digital divide, as it's been referred to. Not everyone has access to the internet and digital resources. The internet penetration rates vary significantly across the, uh, the globe, and this also deserves further attention in relation to transnational families who have not had privileged access to, uh, to the internet and to digital resources. Thank you so much. Why should we care about migrant narratives, and do these narratives ever bring about any changes in real life? First of all, all narratives are important, narrative stories. Personal narratives are very important in social relations. We use stories to do everything in life. We argue for something, we try to persuade others through our stories, we, we create and maintain social bonds and so forth. We share stories with those who are close to us. Uh, in narrative studies, one talks of so-called small stories, um, these are everyday shorter stories, and then there are big stories. And migrant narratives, if we refer to them as you know, narratives of uh, people who have traveled or migrant, are an example of big stories. And these migrant narratives are valuable for giving us insight into issues concerning migration and transnationalism. You ask, why should we care? Well, for refugees, these narratives provide us with an understanding of the perils that they faced uh, or people will endure in order to seek a better life for themselves and for their families. And we should be reminded of what we do in fact have in our own lives. And then there's the question of whether these narratives ever bring about changes in real life. And I'd say definitely yes. Thank you so much. That's such an important point. Um, so could you share with us your research agenda within the next five to ten years? First of all, I'd like to stress that uh, my passion is studying transnational families and uh, language socialization in children, of children in um, multilingual families, so I'm sure I will go that direction. Because um, I started off basically looking at language socialization of, of young two-year-olds in uh, bilingual families. And, um, and then I moved on to looking at uh, communities in diaspora, especially the Filipino diaspora in Norway but still looking at families and looking at issues of language socialization in relation to network theory. And then I've continued on by chance. I started working with linguistic landscapes. I don't know if you know that field of inquiry, looking at the uh, use of uh, various languages in um, the public sphere. And that got me very, very interested in language policy. I was working with colleagues uh, in Ethiopia on that, especially one particular colleague, and we've written quite a lot about various uh, Ethiopian uh, linguistic landscapes. And then when family language policy started to become a field about 10 years ago, started the, you know, there was one seminal work that basically functioned as a magnet for those working on families, social linguists working on families, uh, that renewed my interest and brought me back to looking at families. And I brought with me my interest in language policy. So uh, I will continue. I see myself working with multilingual families and family language policy research, but also looking at interaction. And what I'm especially interested in, as I talked about yesterday, is looking at, um, at online uh, personal blogs 
and other resources for multilingual families to see what they have to offer. That'll be an exciting area to look at. I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. <laughs>